Welcome to Reflecting on His Word, a Bible study intended to help Christians deepen their walk with the Lord by deepening their understanding of Scripture. Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday to you. It's time for Sunday School. We miss you guys, but we're excited because it think, seems like things are uh, about to open up. There are many things that are open, and uh, Governor Pritzker has backed off on some things. I, I'm sorry, I don't want to get po political, but um, we're going to get to see each other, and that's going to be very fun. It'll be good to see people, and I hope everybody's doing well. I had a couple of really good weeks, and Sheila and I each did um, the last couple weeks, but this current week... Um, has been a bit of a trial for me, and uh, things haven't gone exactly the way I would choose, the way I like, the way I call good. But, you know, I'm reminded that everything that comes our way, whether it be seems tragic or it's very pleasing to us or it's just a long haul, whatever it is that is come your way, that was first sifted through our your Heavenly Father's loving fingers. So we can rest assured that everything that comes our way is coming via his will. Now, sometimes that's kind of scary. Sometimes we wonder why he's putting us through things. But remember, it's all about glorifying him. It's not about making this a vacation. It's not about, about being uh, having an all-access pass to everything wonderful. It's not anything like that. It, it's sometimes hard work. It's sometimes drudgery. Sometimes it's scary. But it's always about glorifying the Lord, and you'll always be glad that you did. When we're, when we're on board with his program, we're exercising faith and following courageously. It's going to be an exciting time. That's how it is when you're part of the church universal, the universal church belonging to Christ. Remember in the first three chapters of Ephesians, we talked about what the characteristics of that universal church are. Now in these last three chapters, we're going to talk about how we need to behave and in light of all this that we are in the church universal and in Christ. He's going to tell us and give us instructions on how to behave. It's exciting stuff. It's exciting to belong to the Lord knowing that he's got control of everything. I just need to make sure I let him control me. So we're continuing in the book of Ephesians. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to do the latter half of the fourth chapter of Ephesians, verses 17 through 32, the title, Not As. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from this life, from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. And let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for all that it means to be a part of your universal church, to be in Christ, all of us as a body seeking to do your will. We thank you for all that means to us. Now, Lord, as you reveal to us your truth from 
this portion of your scripture. Help us to have hearts and minds that are inclined to you. Help us to have a will that is desirous to serve you. Give us the strength and courage we need to pursue this matter, to be all that we need to be and glorify you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, not as being our title, our working title, I didn't uh, underscore that so much because eh, it wasn't as clever as uh, I wanted it to be. And I'm sure sometimes you think my titles aren't as clever as I think they are. Ha! But I enjoy them. So, this one not so enjoyable. Not as, in this, pray, in this case, verses 17 through 19, not as they are. Remember that bustling port city of Ephesus was not uh, in the original Jewish kingdom. It's not uh, populated with Jews. It's populated with people that have no Jewish background or very little. Uh, there were some Jews there, I'm sure, but uh, not that very many. We're speaking strictly to an audience of folks that are Gentiles that have accepted Christ out of that world uh, to become believers in Christ. And Paul admonishes them. He says, therefore, I testify in the Lord, don't be like them. Walk not as other Gentiles walk. They walk in the vanity of their mind. They have their understanding darkened. They're blinded. The, the evil of this present age, the evil of their flesh overrides. And they, do, they base their judgment on their emotions and um, what their flesh is crying out for. You hear people from time to time say, oh, follow your heart. And, and that's, that's very poor advice. The heart is desperately wicked. Uh, we can't even know the depths of just how wicked the human heart is. I don't want to follow my heart. I've been following my flesh too much lately. I've put on weight um, in this time of, of being sent home and, uh, and being locked up. And uh, I don't need to be listening to the flesh. The flesh has misguided me, and I've allowed it to, and I should not. We don't need to listen to the flesh. We don't need to listen to our hearts. We need to listen to the Holy Spirit. We need to be not as they are. We need to be what Christ would have us be. In 2 Corinthians 4, chapter 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine unto them. Without that glorious light, without... Uh, God providing that, we cannot see it. We cannot know what God would have us know. We cannot understand the gospel without his help. Their minds and their eyes are blinded. They cannot see. They don't get it. If you've ever participated in open debate in a public forum, um, whether it be you know, on a bus somewhere or an airplane or uh, when you're trapped with people and you end up talking to them that you wouldn't normally talk to or at the supermarket or on social media, of course, that's a great place for debate and argument. And uh, there are a lot of clouded, darkened, flesh-following minds there as well. Um, some folks just don't seem to get it. And Paul admonishes his, his hearers to not listen to that aspect, to not do as you used to do, not do as they do, but we need to have the mind of Christ. And he says they've had their mind, their minds are blinded. They cannot see. They, do not, they cannot see that glorious gospel of Christ. In Mark 3, 5, he says, And we, we had, I'm sorry, And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. You see, the Pharisees and the scribes and all the religious leaders of that time their minds and hearts were darkened. They weren't surrendered to God. They were surrendered to their flesh. They wanted to be proud of what they were. They wanted to have power. Uh, it could have been any number of things, but it was not about God. And they became angry when Jesus was going to heal this man. And uh, he sets the stage very well. Um, Jesus had very good stage presence. I don't mean that in a uh, sacrilegious kind of way, but he knew how to capture his audience's attention to capture their imagination and he set the stage very well he he saw that they were all angry he made sure they're all watching and he said stretch forth your hand and it was healed and one of the exciting things about god's healing um now i'm not talking about the sanctification process in our lives but his healing he heals completely 
and he, he heals instantly. It's not something um, I've heard of some faith healers that say, well, you have faith and, uh, and they smack him on the forehead and said, you'll be getting better. Um, that's not how it works. That's not how it works in God's economy anyway. That In some demonic economy, that may be what they're they're doing. But when God heals, he heals instantly. He said, stretch forth your hand. And uh, of course, he was able to do that. But the scribes and the Pharisees, uh, his audience at that time, most of them did not understand. And they could not understand because they did not have uh, the light, God's light in their hearts. First Timothy 4, 2 says, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Paul's referring to how people who God has approached, they have, uh, they have somewhat of a pursuit of God. They're pursuing godly things, but their heart's not in it. Their conscience is seared uh, as with a hot iron. Uh, when you have an injury in uh, primitive times, when, to keep from getting infection, to stop bleeding, and to just go ahead and, and be done with the injury, folks would very often get uh, some kind of metal heated up, very hot, red hot, and you touch that to the flesh and it instantly sears it and scars it and it's, it'll seal up any blood vessels, it cauterizes any blood vessels and it kind of closes the thing up a little bit and uh, it'll eventually all be closed over with a scar, uh, nice and not so neat, I guess. Um, it's a whole lot better than bleeding out and, or getting parasites in there maybe um, and it's certainly better than bleeding to death. But uh, it's not good for your conscience. When you, when, you, when you push away the Spirit, when you uh, grieve the Holy Spirit and you ignore your conscience, you sear it with a hot iron and you make yourself dull to the things of the Lord. And that's what they do. We need to do not as they are. We need to be as Christ would have us be. And of course, not being like them is important, but not as you were. We were that way. We were all, you know, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all been there. And we need to make every effort to yield ourselves to the Lord so we can be not as we were. He says, but you have not so learned Christ. They were doing all these terrible things. He says, but this is not what God's teaching you. This is not what the Spirit is teaching you. You need to do what the Spirit's teaching. You need to do as God would have you do. You need to follow the Lord and his instructions do as he's teaching you. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off. I mean, he's saying, if you know Christ, if you've trusted Christ, put off those old things, put off the old man, stop it, just stop it. I remember an old, uh, you, uh, some of you, I don't know, I think most of you are old enough to remember maybe uh, Bob Newhart as a comedian. Um, one, of his, one of his gags he did, uh, most of his stuff were long takes uh, and in comedy. That means it, it took a long time to set it up, kind of like how I, I tell stories. It's kind of a long take. You gotta you gotta stick out the long haul to hear it. But one of his bits, um, he's a, he's playing a psychiatrist. Uh, of course, he did that in his tele one of his television shows. But he's playing a psychiatrist, and they explain their problems, and he says he says, "What do you want me to do, doc?" And he says, "Stop it, just stop it, stop it." And he, he continues to tell them to stop it. And that would, that's, that's funny because life is seldom that simple. And it's not that simple just to put off the old man. It's a process. It's a hard thing to do. But that's the instruction. That's what Paul is telling these people at the church at Ephesus. You put off the old man considering the former things. Uh, put off that corruption, the, the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in your spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness, in true holiness. Oh, that's what we need to do. Put off the old man. Put on the new. I remember when I was in the military, I was in Saudi Arabia for a short time. We were not at war. This was uh, back, as a matter of fact, uh, the first few months after we bombed Libya. Um, I don't know if you remember that. But when they announced it on the news, I was getting a shot at the clinic in Oklahoma City preparing to fly out the next day to fly to Saudi Arabia, spent three months there. Um, it was springtime, so it was only very, very hot. And uh, when we got ready to leave, we had to load our own aircraft. We were pushing pallets onto that aircraft and picking stuff up and stacking things. And oh my, I, I was tired and hot and sweaty. And then we had a 24-hour flight. 
And by the time I got to the airport in Oklahoma City, I'm here to tell you, uh, I was covered in uh, nastiness, and it was so good to get in that. Uh, it, and it doesn't sound attractive to change clothes in a men's room, but I'm here to tell you to get get out of those old sweaty clothes and take a little bit of a sink bath and put on clean garments. Oh, that was such a relief. It wasn't all the relief that I needed, but it sure was a good start. And that's what Paul is telling these people to do. Put off that old man. Put off the grunginess. Stop doing those things. Just stop and put on the new man. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Allow God to make a change in you. He's going to do wonderful things in your life if you'll just let him. Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. We need true holiness, not to muck around in the uh, old man plodding around in the mud and the mire and pretending like we're different. We need to be different. We need to put off the old man, come out of that pig pen and be what God would have us to be, not as you were. <clears throat> First Thessalonians 4, 9 says, but as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you for you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. We're taught of God. He's teaching us. He's providing for us. We ought to love one another. Um, and that's how it ought to be. Um, remember early in the earlier verses talking about God teaching and God bringing us along. Uh, Romans 6, 6 through 7, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth, we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. You see, we need to die to self. We need to crucify that old man. This is just another word picture um, expressing a very deep theological truth. We, you know, we were talking about putting off the old man. Now we need to slay the old man. We need to die to self um, and, and, and not serve that, but walk in a renewed life that we not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. If we will die to self, if we'll kill that portion of us, we won't have to spend time in that pig pen. Romans 12, 2 says, And be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We need to be transformed. This is about change. It's about sanctification. It's about putting off the old man. It's about crucifying the old man and being transformed, being changed, being substantially different in our character. And that's something we need to allow God to work in our lives. Paul's urging them to not be as they were. <clears throat> Excuse me. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. If you belong to Christ, this will happen. Now, if you're not discipled well, if you're, uh, you have bad teaching, if you go to television for all your theology, if you get your theology from uh, Christian uh, modern Christian music, um, you're going to be a little messed up. You need to get your theology from the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he's going to perform uh, a transformation within you. He's going to change things. Um, if you're in Christ, you'll be a new creature. And those old things pass away. All things are become new. That's an exciting thing. Uh, if you think my new self is bad, you should have seen my old self. So uh, Luke 9, 23 through 24 and he said to, uh, to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever will save his life will lose it. But whoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Now, the picture, the word picture here is of actually losing your life. Take up your cross, go up on that hill and be crucified. But that's not exactly what he's talking about. We're talking about killing that inner man, that old man the putting off that old man, dying to self. And if you do it for his sake, you'll be saving it. It's kind of an uh, upside-down economy. If we listen to the flesh, if we listen to the world, if we listen to our hearts, we say, gimme, 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 gimme. And all we bring on to ourselves is misery. All those things, all the selfishness, all the things the flesh 
calls out for, all the things our little heart calls out for, a lost mind calls out for, is all bad. It's all self-defeating. Selfishness in itself is self-defeating. Uh, picture, if you will, one of the more common and easier outlined uh, phenomenon in our society. <clears throat> You're on a highway. The orange sign says, we're losing a lane up here. The left lane is closed ahead. What do the selfish people do? Why, they stay in that left lane or even jump into that left lane, and they go zooming on ahead because they don't want to be stuck in all the backed up traffic. How did the, backed up, the traffic get backed up, you say? It's not because of the construction. It's because of the people that jumped in the left lane and zoomed ahead. And so they're working hard to avoid something that, in essence, they've caused, that practiced that practice of zooming ahead is causing that. People, you know, someone decided, someone was the first one way back when that said, I'm not waiting behind people. I'm going to zoom on ahead. I'm going to I'm going to be more clever than everybody else in the world. I'm going to cut in line. I'm going to cheat. And in that regard, selfishness is self-defeating. When we do for the flesh, when we do for a lost mind, when we do for worldly wisdom, it's going to leave us disappointed every single time. It's self-defeating. We need to be as Christ would have us be, surrendering to him, taking up our cross daily and following him. If you will save your life, you'll lose it. But if you'll lose your life for his sake, then you will save it. It's an exciting promise. So not as they were, they are, not as you were, and not as the world is. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be ye, ang be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole, and it talks about reform. Uh, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Put away that lying. Speak every man truth to his neighbor. This is an important concept. We Our speech needs to be... Uh, seasoned and wonderful and and loving uh he says be angry and sin not he's not he's not encouraging his audience to be angry he said but the the message here is go ahead and be angry if it's a righteous anger if it's the right thing to be angry about but sin not take it not to a sinful degree don't hang on to it for you know weeks and weeks you need to deal with the issue and give it to god let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Don't make wrath a part of your lifestyle. You know, a lot of people are very negative these days. Uh, you may have known somebody that all the time complains. Complain, 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 complain. Well, a lot of times, if it's examined and if, if, if you lovingly approach them, you can help them understand that their complaints are actually just a habit. They've gotten in the habit of when they approach a situation, when they get input, whether it be verbal or visual, they automatically look for the problem. They want to be the most clever person in the room and say, aha, well, see, look, you didn't do that. Or, ah, look, see, you deserve that. You're a terrible person. You know, they want to find some negative aspect of what they're looking at. Uh, and a lot of times it's so they can appear to be clever and it becomes a habit. So we need to not do that. We need to put that off. Let, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't get in the habit of doing any of these things. Don't give place to the devil. Don't let his message be what comes out of you, whether it be angry, a bad response. Now, there is righteous uh, anger. There is uh, righteous violence even. We we use, we think of negatively when we think of violence, um, but I know that there are soldiers. We just passed Memorial Day, and... It's heartwarming and gratifying to know that there have been generations and generations of men who have done violence, done what we would think are unspeakable things. They've seen horrible things and been a part of horrible things for our sake to protect us from those things, to keep the wolves from the door, to keep the bad out so we can enjoy uh, what we have here. Um, it's, it's humbling to know that they've done that. And that's provided for us. So that, that violence is important and we've got to do it, but sin not. Be angry and sin not. 
Let the sun not go down on your wrath. Don't give place to the devil. We don't. We can't let that turn into something evil. We need to do what we need to do, but do it in the Lord. He talks about let him that stole steal no more, and but rather let him labor. He's he's turning the energy of someone who's doing bad into something that is good, and that's important for us. And you and I are all we, we all at one time were as a thief. We stole. We're you know we. Uh, metaphorically speaking, we, we were stealing, but now we're made better. Let us labor, working with our hands, the thing which is good, that we may give to him that needeth. We need to be changed and pass this along. I'm reminded of, uh, you've seen confidence courses or uh, ropes courses, and some of them are designed for team building, rah, 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 corporate, corporate, corporate. Um, and that's good. It's good to learn teamwork if you're in a fighting unit. And it's it's good to learn learn teamwork anytime. And uh, but it's it is an important aspect of what we are doing here. Um, there's nothing that I've ever taught about the Bible that hasn't been taught to me, at least by the Spirit. Very much I get from other men who have written commentaries, who have translated uh, Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic. I don't know those languages. I struggle just to know English. So and, and some would say I don't. Uh, but we help one another. We, we who were once in sin uh, allow God to uh, take care of that sin for us and begin a new work in us. And we reach back to those that are still in sin and help them out of that muck and that mire. Help them to also learn how to put off that old man. And then he goes on to say, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. No corrupt communication. Um, earlier talked about lying in, in uh, the scripture up there in 25. Uh, no, don't lie. Uh, no corrupt communication. And I became uh, convicted of this some years ago. Uh, sometimes you can get in the habit and most people wouldn't mean it to be a lie per se. But let's say someone says, what's the answer to this question? You say, A. And they go, no, it's B. Oh, that's right. I knew that. Uh, might be our response. Well, if you knew that, you you wouldn't have said the other. Now it's possible you, now that you're reminded of the answer, realize, yes, I see the truth in that. I became convicted that I need to make sure that I don't say something that is not true. Even, you know, I, I, yeah, I knew that. Well, what I need to say is I should have known that. Now that I hear that, yes, I know. And that seems like a small thing, but if we would practice being thoughtful about how we respond to such things, we can avoid the whole lying thing. We can, and we we won't have that corrupt communication. Um, and speaking of corrupt communication, um, as a young child, uh, I had quite the mouth on me. Um, I made sailors blush. I I considered it an art form to use bad words and and terrible language. Um, I wouldn't do it in front of my mother or teachers because. Uh, they were still corporal punishment back then. I soaked up a lot of corporal punishment, deserved every bit of it and more. But I had, when I accepted Christ, he took that from me. Um, but unfortunately, I've been uh, inundated with that most of my adult life with driving truck and working uh, blue collar stuff um, around people that use all kinds of bad communication. We need to let no corrupt communication proceed out of our mouth. And in my opinion, that also includes, uh, to me, if you make a word rhyme with the bad words you're avoiding saying, but use it in the same setting, you're basically using that word. You know, you put I-N-G or I-N apostrophe on the end of something, you know what you're saying. You're replacing a bad word with a sound alike word. That's corrupt communication. Because what we hear in our minds is what the world is saying. And all you're doing is mimicking the world. And that is corrupt communication. We need to put that off from us. We need to stop saying the things the world says. We need to stop repeating their mantras. We need to stop repeating their bumper stickers. We need to stop using their foul language. Because language is where a lot of thought comes from. Uh, we think differently than the people that speak other languages. The thought processes are different. And the language is different. So when we have corrupt language, we're going to have corrupt 
thoughts. We're going to have corrupt minds. We need to put that old man off. We need to put that old habit of sounding like the world. And, and I guess sometimes people just like to let go of a curse word once in a while just to let them know you're serious. But you know what? I'd rather be known for being serious about the Lord. Um, let the world misunderstand me all they want. I don't need to compromise my speech just to sound worldly. It's not edifying to them and it's not ministering grace unto those hearers. So we need to be not as the world is. Psalm 19, 14 says, let the words of my, uh, my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let it all be. Let the things that are going on. Now, it's not just the words, the meditations of the heart. It's not enough just to bite your tongue and not say that, that nasty thing you're thinking about. We need to put that off. We need to change our habits, not get in the habit of that nasty response, not to get in the habit of that bitter response or that angry response. We need to get in the habit of having an edifying and gracious response. And yes, I know um, we all need to work on that. Um, <clears throat> there we go. Enough said on that. Uh, Luke 6, 45, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Parallel with the uh, talk of the tree, a, a good tree can't bring forth bad fruit and a, and a bad tree can't bring forth good fruit. It brings forth the fruit, the, forth the fruit that it is. If it's an apple tree, apples. If it's a pecan tree, pecans. And yes, it's pecans, not pecans. So uh, a tree brings forth the fruit that it is. And the, what's coming out of your mouth, if it's, if it's dirty, if it's bitter, if it's angry, if it's corrupt, well, that's coming from your heart. They say a lot of comedy contains a bit of truth and a lie contains a bit of truth. And a lot of times we reveal ourselves with the, how we joke about things, but we're revealing the darkness in our heart very often. And certainly our language can also do that. The, the abundance of our heart comes out through our mouth and if it's corrupt, it's because we have a corrupt heart and we need to change that. We need to be letting our mouth speak of the abundance and love we get through Christ. We need to be speaking love and grace to the world around us. Proverbs 23, 7 says, for he thinketh in his heart. So, excuse me, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. There you go. If, if you're spewing corruptness, we need to change that. Now, sometimes you may have to bite your tongue for a little bit and start working on changing that mind, but let's change what we can. Let's do all that we can to do the work of the Lord. It, we're not called to sit on a stool and wait for God to make us beautiful and renew, renewed and polished and, and sanctified and we're good to go. It's a process and we participate in that process. We get our sanctification from the Lord, but we need to practice obedience. We need to practice faith. We need to practice a mindset of ministering grace unto those that hear as we speak and, and see as we do. Our life speaks of what's going on inside our minds and our hearts. Colossians 4, 6 says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Well, that's good advice. And that's a commandment to us out of scripture. Our speech needs to always be with grace and seasoned with salt. It needs to be savory. It needs to be full of the love that God would have for people. Does that mean we don't ever talk about mundane things? Does that mean that the earthly things do not matter? Of course not. But our response to the world around us, our message to the world around us needs to end up and be about and be saturated with the love that God has for the lost world so we can tell them about a God who loves them, about a God who's changed us, about a God who's made us new. You know, you know, and you don't have to be afraid that you don't know a lot about how to how to teach theology. You don't have to be afraid that you you maybe you're a new Christian or you just haven't been sharing your faith very much. You can always share your testimony, like the blind man who was healed by Jesus and was brought before the uh, religious leaders of the time. And they said, was this Jesus? Did, they, did he claim he was God? What? He says, look, I don't know. I don't want to get involved in your politics. This I know. I once was blind, 
and now I see. And we can share that wonderful message with our neighbors, with our coworkers, with the people we're uh, stuck on a train with or in an airplane. We can share with them what God has done in our lives. Now, be aware when you share your faith, there are some that are going to uh, be rude about it and tell you you're stupid and superstitious and they will uh, just, they will shun you and say, whatever, get away from me. But you need to understand it's going to make a difference in their lives. The Holy Spirit is going to use those words, uh, will use scripture, will use your testimony to speak to them. They may not respond right away, but they will hear the call of the Spirit. So share on, brethren, share on. And then, of course, we need to walk in love. Um, at how, how we deal with the world and how we deal with each other is supremely important. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Remember, we talked in uh, earlier chapters about, in the first chapter, about being sealed with the Holy Spirit. This is your promise. I, we, God has said, I've made arrangements. Here is the token of my promise to you. You'll one day be in heaven with me. Here's the Holy Spirit as a comforter. Here's the Holy Spirit to be your advocate. Here's the Holy Spirit to guide you, to interpret to you, to provide all that you need. Uh, so grieve not that Holy Spirit. Where he says, look, I've given you this Holy Spirit. Uh, he's, it, God's given us the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve that Holy Spirit, but submit to that. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another and tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for God's sake, hath forgiven you. Now, this is not all about words. In fact, it's more about the heart than anything. Um, I, I've spent a lot of time on social media and it's been a wonderful experience. I've learned a lot of things. Um, I hobnob with, I guess, if you call it that. I follow a lot of uh, religious types, a lot of prominent pastors, and uh, some of them are basically are teaching me a course in how to do it, and some are teaching me a course in how to not do it. And one of the things I've seen in my life uh, when people debate about something, if they are not satisfied, if they feel like you're not hearing them or they're angry with you, well, I say, well, God bless you. You've heard that before, haven't you? Um, that's not a blessing. That's taking the Lord's name in vain, if anything. It's, it's, the words are important, but the heart has to be there too. We need to be tenderhearted. We need to, have, to speak with love. Be kind to people. Don't just, don't just say kind words. Be a kind person. And our kindness needs to be a thoughtful brand of kindness, not just doing what the world says or what someone asked when, when a beggar on the street, a wino says, hey, can you give me some money? Can you give me some money? Well, it, it, I don't care what story he comes up with, whether, well, I need to catch a bus to go see my sister-in-law or my children are sick and hungry or what his story is. The bottom line is he's going to continue to ruin his life with alcohol when you give him that money. So our loving response to him may not be giving him what he wants. Our loving response may not be to tell people what they want to hear. Um, I love my dear wife. And she loves me, and she has the courage and love in her heart to sometimes say, Robert, you need to know this. And she'll share with me that what you're doing doesn't appear to be good, or I'm afraid people are going to think this, or you need to not wear that. Uh, uh, and this is the thing I need to listen to because she speaks to me with true love. I've, I've known flattering people that will tell me anything I want to hear and they don't help me a bit, but my loving wife helps me because she tells me truth. Um, we have two mirrors in our house, two full length mirrors. Um, one of them is an accurate mirror and one of them kind of skinnies you up a little bit. Um, I like the skinny one, skinny you up a little bit one, but you know what? It's a lie. I'm, st I'm still going to be bulging where I shouldn't be um, when I go out into, into public. So there's no sense in deceiving ourselves. There's no sense. No one want, needs to be deceived because you're just leading them to disaster and disappointment. Um, if you tell your children, oh, you're the most beautiful, talented, uh, wonderful person in the world. You can be president of the United States if you want to. They're going to go out there and discover, you know what? 
I'm not even very good looking and I don't have a, a single chance of being president. Oh, that's a lie. Now, do we need to tell them they're ugly and, and useless and, and they have no hope of achievement? Well, no, not that either. We need to be encouraging, but we need to be encouraging with a, a truthful kind of courage. We need encouragement. We need to be uh, loving people with some truth in it. We need to be seasoned with truth and wisdom. We need to guide them to what they need to know, not just give them fluffy words, not just be flattering to them. Don't, don't just tell them what they want to hear. We need to tell them what they need to hear. John 13, 34 through 35 says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also have love one to another. For by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. I'm comforted that John repeats himself almost as much as I do. Um, but it's worth repeating. Love one another. Love one another. 1 John 4, 20 through 21 says, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God will love his brother also. That's the bottom line. If we can't love each other, if we can't love folks, then the love of God is not in us. Now, I'm not trying to tell you that the moment you become a Christian, that you're going to just feel this, ah, you know, flowers and rainbows and unicorns kind of love for, I just want to hug everybody because there are going to be people that make you very unhappy, but you can love them knowing that they're deceived. If they're doing something sinful and terrible, it's because they're deceived. They know not what they do. Even if they're being mean to you, it's because they're deceived and they do not know what they need to do. Now, if what they're doing, that deception, has caused them to kick in your front door to harm your family, obviously your actions can be different than it is with a coworker that just is always kind of rude to you. But we need to love all of them. We need to love everybody and know that we, if, if it's in our power, if we can do it safely, we need to approach people with love and tell them about Jesus. We need to help them to understand. And we need to understand as we deal with them that they are needing love in order to understand and to give out love. Walk in love. We need to love one another. Oh, did I tell you we should love one another? That's what we need to do as the universal church. We're a part of that church. God has worked a work in us. So we need to be all that he'd have us be. We need to practice these things. Put off the old man. Put on Christ. And walk in love. I thank you for your time. And I hope this has been a blessing to you. And I hope we're uh, clearly showing what's going on in Scripture. What Paul is trying to get his hearers to understand that we need to not be as the world. We need to be the new creation. Okay, so I hope my lispering, stammering tongue hasn't gotten in the way of this very important message we get from Paul about how we as the universal church need to be not as they are, the Gentiles, not as we were and not as the world, but we need to be that which God would have us be to allow that sanctification process to make a change in us, to walk in love, to walk in a spirit of love and make a difference in this world. Lifting up the name of Jesus. Love you guys. Bye now.